All right, welcome back uh, to Chromosome Organization Part 2. So last time we left off talking about the concept of what DNA supercoiling was. So if we take a piece of DNA, attach it at both ends, rotate one end, um, unwinding it one complete turn, you end up with something that has a negative supercoil. If you twist it in the opposite direction, you end up something with a positive supercoil. And these supercoils are just twists of the DNA around itself to alleviate the tension that would be created by this extra twist, because the extra twist itself would leave DNA helical conformations that are not stable. So, in the bacterial uh, chromosome, it is negatively supercoiled in order to compact the size. So we know that the DNA binding proteins forming the loop structures give us about a tenfold compaction. The next additional hundredfold compaction is achieved through negative supercoiling, and it is specifically negative supercoiling. So in E. coli, there is about one negative supercoil per every 40 turns of the double helix. And this has a couple of major effects. So one, of course, is that compaction of the chromosome. You know, we get that extra 100-fold compaction that we need in order to fit the DNA inside of the bacteria. But it also creates a little bit of tension that can be released when the DNA strands are separated. And this DNA strand separation would occur as a precursor to either replicating the chromosome or just simply by expressing a gene. So if we are making messenger RNA, we need to separate the two strands. So here we have a circular chromosome with a negative supercoil. If we take the two strands, start pulling them apart, the negative supercoil essentially allows that to occur. If that negative supercoil wasn't there, as we pulled the DNA apart, what it would do is induce positive supercoiling. So by storing the DNA in a negative supercoil, it allows us to more easily uh, separate the two strands, which facilitates both replication and transcription, the making of, messenger, uh, of, making of RNAs. Now, this uh, supercoiling effect is facilitated by proteins. One protein is uh, DNA gyrase. Uh, it's also called DNA topoisomerase 2. We'll just call it gyrase now um, to make it easier for you, uh, since these two, topoisomerase 1 and 2, can be hard to remember. So we'll just call it gyrase. That is a historical name of it as well. So this protein complex uses the energy from ATP in order to make negative supercoils. It can also have the effect of when positive supercoils are accidentally introduced, it can, re it can relax them. This can also lead to <coughs> untangling intertwined DNA molecules. So this is using a, the power of ATP in order to um, induce that negative supercoiling. There is also a second enzyme called um, DNA topoisomerase 1. This has kind of the opposite effect uh, where it relaxes negative supercoiling. Um, but since it's relaxing something that is already there, it requires a little bit less energy. And so these two enzymes are kind of working together um, with their competing actions to maintain a proper balance and proper compaction in the, the DNA chromosome. Now, um, how these topoisomerases work is uh, by cutting DNA, right? Now, if you were to cut DNA, that could be a bad thing. So we need to do it in a very controlled manner. 
So here we have uh, <coughs> a four subunit protein. So we have this thing that we can call the lower jaws, and it, you can see there's two subunits here, subunit A, subunit A, uh, second copy, and, and they, they form kind of a hinged region. Then there is um, subunit B, which form these upper jaws. So here's a strand of DNA. It comes in, it clamps around it, okay, and binds to that DNA. That DNA can bind in other locations as well. So it will bind along the side of the protein and along the side of this subunit on the far side. And you get DNA binding over here and over here. So it binds the DNA into the shape, right? The jaws then clamp down to enclose this loop. That way, when it cuts, which is occurring in the next step, the DNA can't float away or become undone. And when we cut it, it allows this strand to pass below the lower strand because we've cut that lower strand. So this right here, we cut here, and then it can pass through, and then the enzyme uh, puts it back together. And so if you were to take a circular piece of, of DNA, add DNA gyrase, which is, induces ne negative supercoiling, and you were to add ATP, you would end up with negative supercoils. Now, let's move along to uh, eukaryotic chromosomes, because eukaryotic chromosomes work slightly differently. So as I said before, um, eukaryotic chromosomes can have more than one chromosome. Bacteria typically have one, and it's circular. Um, eukaryotic species, because they tend to have more genes um, and also additional sets of chromosomes, which allow for um, sexual reproduction, we have several of them. So for humans, we have two sets of 23 chromosomes, and that's different for every uh, single species. Each chromosome contains a single linear piece of DNA. Now remember in um, bacteria, it is a circular piece of DNA. So here in a eukaryotic, organisms, they are linear pieces. Each one can have hundreds to millions of base pairs, and uh, typically can have, um, each one can, can have hundreds, typically several thousand genes. Now, in lower eukaryotes, such as yeast, those genes are relatively small. and have very uh, short and, and not very many introns present. If you remember, these introns are little regions within a gene that are not expressed as amino acids. They are typically trimmed out. Again, these are, are kind of few and tend to be somewhat short. In higher eukaryotes, the genes tend to be much, much longer. And oftentimes, um, these genes actually are functionally equivalent to the fusion of several partner genes seen in lower organisms. So if you have several genes that need to work together to do one job, now you've created one super gene that does the whole thing. This also tends to have um, higher organisms uh, tend to have more introns, and those introns can be very long. That What these different introns do is allow a single gene to make multiple different proteins. And since a lot of these proteins are fusions of a bunch of smaller proteins, each working together to do part of a bigger job, we can have slight variations on that job. 
So it's not that higher organisms really have that much more genes. They just have more variety that they can make from a single gene. Now, um, eukaryotic chromosomes typically have three types of DNA sequences. Uh, so again, we need to have, um, and, and these, these are three extra sequences. Um, one of these is the origin of replication. This is similar to what we see in, in bacteria. We need to have a, a site where we start. Uh, slightly different in um, higher organisms, and I'll, I'll point that out here in a moment. There is also this region called the centromere. The centromere is going to be, play a pivotal role during mitosis or meiosis as a central point where the mitotic spindles can attach to each individual chromosome. Um, since bacterial chromosomes are typically one piece of DNA, we don't need to have a complex mechanism for separating them. Since now we have many chromosomes, we need to have more organization in order to separate them appropriately. So this requires the centromere, which is um, that central connection point for segregation. We also have the ends of the chromosome. Since this is a linear piece, there are ends to the DNA. And this actually creates a problem in replication that we'll discuss later. And the telomeres, which are repetitive sequence at the ends, are essentially a solution to this replication problem. So here's an example of um, a eukaryotic uh, chromosome. You can see here that we have a telomere at each end. And this is made up largely of repetitive sequences, okay? Uh, the same type of repetitive sequences that we see in, in um, bacterial cells, but the actual sequences themselves are different. Here we can see we have all these different genes, but here you can see that instead of a single origin of replication, we have many different origins of replications. And that's because this piece of DNA is so much significantly longer than what we see in a bacterial chromosome. Waiting for one replication start point to progress to both ends would just simply take too long. So again, we have um, many Origins of replication, these typically are sitting at around 100,000 base pairs apart from each other, so they're fairly uniform along the chromosome. We have the telomeres. These telomeres prevent this DNA strand from shortening. The fact that you have a loose end creates a replication problem, which again we'll, we'll, we'll discuss in detail later, but the telomeres help prevent that. We also have the centromere, and the centromere has a lot of repetitive DNA sequences, and it binds a slew of different proteins that are involved in binding um, the chromosome for segregation during mitosis and meiosis. And this is facilitated by these uh, kinetochore proteins. Um, so they bind into the centromere region.